Now, what do you think I get asked most when I'm working abroad? It's not, who are you, or what do you do? But it's, where are you from? Now, when I respond with New York, I get many different remarks. Uh, one time in Qatar, the Syrian taxi driver was like, are you crazy? Like, what are you doing here? We all want to go to New York, and you've come to a desert? <laughs> or most of the time, I get, wow, you're from the city? And I'm like, no, I'm from upstate, the real New York. And I am. I'm an Albanian from Auburn, not that far from here. Uh, my name is Joey, actually Joey Foster Ellis. Think Joey like a baby kangaroo, Foster like the beer, and Ellis like the island. However, I also go by Joey and Yusuf, and some of my friends in China actually call me Jidan, which means egg, white on the outside, yellow within. Within each name lies a certain identity that I have developed in that culture where that name evolved from. But all of them are the derivative of one. What I want to talk to you about is how identity and reality can be questioned through a language other than your own. Now, when you first hear new languages, they can seem made up, no different than the childhood languages we used to create. Now, when I was young, I spoke fake languages because I couldn't master real ones. I didn't speak to the age of five, and I must say I was particularly good at fake Russian. My brother Anderson and I would go buy sandwiches at local delis, and he would always be my translator. I'd be like, And then my brother would turn to the clerk and say, he wants mustard. <laughs> to understand the places I have visited, I have found that as long as you relate the unknown to the familiar, that unknown will no longer be a stranger. And with language, it's no different. Like, when I was in China, and I was trying to get better at bargaining skills, I had to master Bush agenda, okay? Now, that actually means this isn't real, it's fake. Now, because it was the time of the Bush administration, I related that to the Bush agenda, and it made me get much better deals. In, in Arabic, in Qatar, when I was learning shukran, uh, which means thank you, I thought of shu and crayon. And when I was in uh, Sri Lanka, and I wanted to learn, what's up, dude, uh, which is kohamade, uh, I would think of cows, ham, and a day of the week. You respond with Hyundai, which means good, and I'd always think of Hyundai, the, the car company. Now, sometimes when you actually begin to know the language, you can find other meanings within the words. Take strawberry in Chinese, cao mei. Now, it's actually a literal translation. Cao means grass and mei means berry. But Chinese is a tonal language, so each word can be said in four different ways, and therefore each word can have four different meanings. When I first heard strawberry in Chinese, I didn't hear grass and berry. I didn't hear cao mei. I heard cao mei, which translates as fuck beauty. <laughs> fuck beauty. Oh, I love that. I remember thinking that beneath a beautiful word can lie something so aesthetically distinct, testing my own relationship between beauty and meaning, that there can be multiple layers to words depending on how we see them say them, interpret them. Now, it actually took me two years to learn Chinese once I moved there in 2005 to study at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, Zhongyang Mei Shushuoyan. I remember the first real sentence my professor said to me, for it actually took two years for him to talk to me. He, he said, Zhou Yi, your Chinese is too much, but your dialect is still very good. Which basically means, wow, Joey. Your Chinese has gotten so good, but your sculpture still sucks. <laughs> it was then that I entered this world where I almost became 100% Chinese. I started to spend entire days speaking it, reading it, and dreaming in it. 
Language is a passport, but it can also be a form of deportation for one's own reality. Uh, there was a point at that time in my life when I was sitting in a room of people and I kind of just mentally stepped away from it. I let my ears hear noises rather than meanings. And I thought to myself, like, what is this weird language that I understand and do I actually understand it? See, I learned like a baby in that I would hear what people to told me and I'd respond. And if they responded in an awkward way, then maybe I didn't understand. But if everything was okay, then cool. But I also was lazy and I never double checked anything in a book. So I don't know if I always did or if I still do. Um, it was this deportation that transported me into this alternate world where I felt that I was no longer one high on self-awareness and low on self-acceptance, but free to make whatever I wanted to make. This led me to Jingdezhen, a city I always like to call the land of Willy Wonka for ceramicists. It's a place known for Ming and Qing dynasty uh, blue and white ware. Now, in Jingdezhen, I just made simple, functional pots. Instead of painting Chinese mountains and bamboo forests, I painted deconstructed Chinese comic books. And I drew airplane diagrams based off of safety manuals I stole from Air China flights. <laughs> and then these landscapes of vintage Arabic book covers that I found on the streets of Doha and Beirut. I then started creating these large-scale trees, China trees, that were these installations that to me are just over-glorified chandeliers. To me, Christmas trees are like do-it-yourself sculpture for the masses, showing how creative we all are. I would make these trees in a way that was unattainable by one, but possible by many, inviting large groups of taxi drivers and vegetable sellers into my studio to create them with me side by side. Now, it wasn't just ceramics I was interested in, but also how other materials could be made functional outside of their original purpose. In Indonesia, I created these coral reefs from donated bicycles. And in China, in Beijing, I made these life-size ice sculptures that talked about global warming and its effect on the Himalayas. They melted in the Beijing heat. And now in Doha, I work as a conservation scientist, protecting ancient artifacts and contemporary art from the harsh cutthery environment. I try to protect a cultural heritage that is not my own, but through my own understanding, becomes part of the culture I have created for myself. Now, I love Qatar because it's actually a country no one knows how to pronounce. People say Qatar and Qatar. I've settled on Qatar. Uh, but actually, uh, in Arabic, it's Qatar, okay, in the back of the throat. Now, I would find that very pretentious of myself if I said that at dinner parties. So I always stick to whatever Qatar Airways uses in their commercials. You've just seen these images of my work, and I want to stress that to me, those are just byproducts of the true work which lies in the process of living. These experiences I've shared about how I've seeked my own identity in these different languages I'm interested in, these realities I've immersed myself in, are much more powerful than the objects of art I create. I think what I'm trying to say is that, yes, art is an extension of the artist, but sometimes we put too much value on what is produced rather than seeking to understand who produced it. We are products of our environment, but our environment is also a product of ourselves, made of things that depend on one another in order to give one another meaning. It might not be the places themselves that are important, but the network of connections within them, forming these relationships whose meaning and value go far beyond the material. It's not Asia and the Middle East that made me. It's not my hometown of Auburn, New York, but it's how I interacted with them, how I brought my own personal history to define their present one, showing how a young man raised in upstate New York can be influenced by and influence a culture other than his own. 
you know, there's always this fine line between being an insider and an outsider. Uh, and it's a line that I've always tried to cross from the outside in. But then I realized something. That it's not always about crossing the line, but it's about staying on that line, that area in between both worlds, an area where you can look objectively at two cultures while creating one of your own as well. Relating the unknown to what you know, to where you come from, can give you courage to go places you might have thought you'd never go, or speak languages you thought were impossible to learn. I failed French at least five times. But let me add one more thing. Recently, I discovered there's a bit more to it. On my many trips back here, I've realized that I myself have become that stranger. And now I see that when I relate the familiar to the unknown, I truly begin to see what makes it special. Like, just the other day at the airport, I was just in awe of the carpet. I don't know, it was like so 90s, so elementary school library-esque. I loved it. Now, people always ask me, when will I return? Especially my mother. Um, <laughs> and my answer is this. That day when I become a tourist in my hometown, taking pictures like a Chinese visitor at Niagara Falls, at the most mundane of things, for to really see how beautiful a place like upstate New York is, you need to step outside those shoes and see it as that tourist. For what we wear is just as weird as a burqa. And the finger licks, oh, the finger licks are just as beautiful as the Great Wall. Thank you.